Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 728. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's Easter Tuesday, April 19th, 2022. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, and we're glad you're here. If you're clergy, you're exhausted, you made it through Holy Week, you made it through Easter, you had Monday off, you're, and you're just coming out of that numbness, and oh, there's another show, I gotta watch it. And we're glad you're here. I'm tired, I took a trip up to Jacksonville to do a shakedown trip uh, before we start traveling with the rig. Everything worked fine, happy with uh, 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 the RV. We start our trip to Key West, and then we head north uh, through the summer. We'll keep you uh, posted in my travels. George has survived Holy Week and Easter, and if I'm exhausted, you must be ten times as exhausted as I am. Different reason. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm one of the. I'm. Uh, I'm a, an extrovert. I ga gain energy from people. Mm -hmm. So at the end of a church service, I actually feel better than I do at the start of the church service. I love coffee hour. I love the speaking to people after the church service, and it just sort of recharges my batteries. So Holy Week and the Easter weekend is is always a blast for me. But I think I may have picked up some uh, sepsis again, because I, my wife keeps saying you're so pale, and uh, so she will have I she had me go see the doctor, and the doctor did blood tests, and I do have anemia. Wow! And so now they're going to try to uh, zero in on where the blood loss is. Is I uh, is it too much Mexican food, putting holes in my stomach and colon, or what have you? Oh, but no, geez. it was a wonderful Easter, Kevin. I mean, mm -hmm. I enjoy, I enjoy children especially, and, and mm -hmm. well, I enjoy older people. Sure. Uh, but the Easter egg hunts are such fun, and doing things with people and it, just the joy and the happiness that they have, and it's a, always a wonderful opportunity to basically preach a very simple, very straightforward Christian message. Uh, no need for nuance, no need for cleverness, just preaching the gospel for people who maybe this will be their only opportunity this year uh, to hear the to hear the words of uh, the gospels and of Jesus. So I just look at it as such a Easter is always such a wonderful opportunity to tell out the good news and hopefully get people to look at their lives and come to Christ and in their whole being. Oh, absolutely. If you come to church every week, Easter is going to seem like old hat to you. Because what I'm going to tell you is about the resurrection and about how if Easter didn't happen, none of it matters. The whole Christian message does not matter if Christ was not truly resurrected. Yeah, It's been very funny uh, tourist season. We've had no tourist season to speak of. In years past, we'd get... 30 40 percent of the congregation people vacationing down here in florida or sometimes it would occur during spring break and we would have uh, many of our members go away to visit family and friends for easter people aren't traveling if they are traveling they're heading up north so maybe i had a dozen families say george we'll see you again in october or november this was their last sunday mm -hmm. um but no tourists, no travelers. Uh, COVID is over, but the uh, second, third, and fourth level tourist areas have not recovered. Well, Disney and, and Universal and the beaches may be full, but uh, you get down to the, the other things that you see, you know, in your second week of vacation, people aren't coming to those yet. Well, I think one of the major problems is true inflation. True inflation right now is not 7%. It's probably about between 16 and 18%. I know this because I took Sasquatch, our rig, to the gas station. And we have a 150-gallon tank. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, but uh, at $5.13 uh, a gallon, 
that was a, it, a bit costly, George. And so uh, it wasn't this costly a year ago or two years ago or the first year of COVID in 2020 when, when we bought a rig. Um, the gas I was paying out in Arizona was, uh, I think, 212 or uh, 219 a gallon. That's an incredible expense that people now are enduring post COVID. They don't have to wear their mask anymore, but they have to start opening their wallets a little wider. Yeah, and it it sort of showed like in our Easter, usually we some years we would have a big all out Easter reception afterwards where people would uh, make prepared meals and dishes and mm -hmm. you get people there for an hour and a half eating and, and, and having fellowship. We had that this year, but the quality and the quantity was much less elaborate. And I think it's because of the pricing. Food mm -hmm. costs really have shot high. Uh, fuel costs are tremendously high. Airplane travel is high. Mm -hmm. And when you have people who are many on a fixed income or retirement income or who have small businesses, they don't have really have a cushion to fall back on. So they cut, they're cutting back. So they may, they're, they're honoring their tithes, but that sort of ex, extra income, you know, spending $50 at the grocery store to have a really wonderful uh, pre prepared item for a Sunday brunch at church, that falls by the wayside. Okay, big topic out there. The core, what I call the core 300 are excited because they read a story somewhere that said Uganda is going to start consecrating women bishops and it's going to happen sooner than you think. And apparently the Archbishop of Uganda got up and uh, gave a sermon during Easter and according to this report that I read, the whole sermon was about women bishops. We've done a little research, so you no. and I need to, 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 to hash out the story uh, as to what's really happening here. I hate to disappoint the people who are looking to be offended and looking to get angry, but nothing new, folks, here. Mm -hmm. Church of Uganda was one of the first churches in the Anglican world to ordain women to the priesthood. In their constitution canons, women can be bishops and can have, and this has been there for a long time. The East African revival of the 1930s was led by many, many women. So women have had a very prominent role in the evangelization of Uganda in East Africa. And this shows in the clergy culture of that part of the world, the evangelical clergy. Mm -hmm. Now, in his Easter message, which is not his sermon, but his Easter message, which was a half hour recorded video, which you can watch on Anglican uh, Inc. We've got a copy of it. And not many people have, because it was a half-hour sermon about all the things facing Ugandans, about politics, about economics, and about all these things. And the bishop had about a minute, or Archbishop Stephen Kazimba had about a minute talking about the role of women in the church and how the Church of Uganda has always supported women bishops, so on and so forth. What he did not say is that we're going to consecrate them. The Church of Uganda is quite clear that it, it honors the Gafcon moratoria against the ordination of women to the Episcopate until Gafcon as a group is agreeable. So what you have is a message for domestic consumption to the, you, uh, from a Ugandan to a Ugandan about the role of women in church and society that restates what the church has been talking about and thinking for 30 years. What did not happen was a statement of a change of policy that we're going to abandon the Gafcon moratorium. Are you sure? Because I read somewhere on the internet, this changes everything, Gafcon's over, and um, everybody's breaking their promises, and shame on Uganda, and they're just doing another Kenya. You're sure on this, George? Well, yes, I'm sure. Well, uh, if you're sure, I'm because, sure. Because... Uh, it's important not just to do rewrite stories That's where right. a, a, a Ugandan, a, Ugandan press is not that good. And they, they, they go for the clickbaits, they go for the headlines. Mm -hmm. 
And you basically always need to sort of confirm uh, these things. Now, the stories that the Ugandan press put out, they weren't widespread, only one or two outlets covered them, uh, did not say that they were about to start consecrating women. They just said they were in favor of it. That's not new. There are there are ACNA bishops in favor of women bishops. Absolutely. John, I think John Guernsey, for one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bob Duncan. Does that mean tomorrow they're going to consecrate women bishops in the face of ACNA's uh, constitution canons? No, it doesn't. Yeah. They're just state, restating where they come from on this issue. Well, I think, but there is a built-in fear. Kenya had no trouble. Kenya uh, last year uh, consecrated a, a woman to the episcopate. and Two. It, two uh, and it, it caused a, a lot of consternation within the Anglican world. And especially with the GAFCON, because if GAFCON can't have a moratorium on this, what can GAFCON have a moratorium on? So I, you know, I, I see the angst because, you know, th this has happened before. Well, part of the problem is, and it's a bigger problem of um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. GAFCON is not a natural coalition mm -hmm. in the sense that you have Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals on the same team and they're opposed to the uh, liberal bloc and the institutional bloc as personified by Archbishops Rowan Williams, Justin Welby, Catherine Drifford Shorey, so on and so forth. When you have these two come at it without that uh, common enemy. They don't agree on what happens at the Eucharist. They don't agree on uh, efficacy of prayers for the dead. They don't agree on the place of confession in the church. They don't agree on the role of women in holy orders. They're willing to suspend judgment. They're willing not to make these issues of life and death because they're united in a common target where somebody's doing something really bad that they can all agree is bad. So it, it is one of the weaknesses of Anglicanism and of GAFCON of the latitude which is given to churches and individuals on these these particular issues. Well, but with that... At, Does with this that mean GAFCON's falling apart? Of course no, no. Not. But with that latitude, I see mutual flourishing happening. I see, you know, that desire for mutual flourishing that was promised in the Church of England decades ago kind of happens in GAFCON. It, it certainly does. happens in the ACNA. Now, part of the other thing that we have to is, 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 is understand is that the issues that are front and center in GAFCON's life are not the issues that are front and center in the Western Church's life. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see food riots. There are food riots in Sri Lanka right now. There, are, there is the prices of food is going through the roof because of the wars and all this and that. Starvation is on the horizon. Political corruption, church corruption. Uh, there are di there are provinces. One of the founding primates of Gafcon, Valentino Mokiwa, uh, was removed from office because he was a crook. Corruption. He's from Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania still has a major problem with corruption. Yes, it is. Church of South India, which is sort of being courted by GAFCON, is the dirtiest province in the Anglican world in terms of corruption, where the norm is a crooked bishop. At one time, over half the bishops were under criminal investigation by the police for fraud. Uh, you buy the office of bishop into the Church of South India in order to support, and you and and you get your money back by the assets and cash flow at your disposal. But, so, uh, but I want to talk about. And, but that's just the way they they are taught. It's it's mm -hmm. the culture. This is how you succeed in our culture by be. And they don't call it corruption. It's just this is how you do it. This is you want to succeed here. You have to have this element of skimming off the top. You have to have this element of buying your position, uh, especially in that type of caste society. 
you know it, it, there's it's a built-in corruption that the church has not been able to overcome yeah and this was one of the issues with the amia and its successors you know and the groups that have flown followed that of basically being able to buy bishops mm -hmm. i want a bishop to basically give my orders validity so i can rent one from tanzania from the congo from these places where there are bishops who are dirt poor mm -hmm. and i'll take gladly take a first class flight anywhere you want them to go you prop them up they'll do the right thing you send them home with an honorarium of gratuity and you know this is called simony simony is more of a problem in the life of the developing world churches than is homosexuality um frankly because simony is more rampant is more widespread than the uh than they don't have lgbtq xyz activists in malawi they no. But they do they, have <laughs> they do have crooked bishops of bright malasa bright malasa is the bishop of upper Shire. and in october of last year the province bishops said we've done the audits you've got to go we've caught you with your hand in the cookie jar but we're not going to bring trial against you you just have to resign we're going to give you till june 2022 and Malasa said, okay, I'll resign, but if I resign, I demand that my rights under the Constitution canons be maintained, which is I am paid my salary, given a house and a car until I reach the age of 70. Right, Malasa is in his 40s. That means if the Diocese of Upper Shire wants to get rid of this crooked bishop, they basically will not have the money to have a real bishop because they're paying off this crook uh this this bishop is the one who followed uh one of the one of the uh one of the primates at the, the Pittsburgh greats. yeah conference i mean you know yeah. corruption and uh the the big man syndrome uh is more of a pressing issue in many of these places than the western issues are so we shouldn't yeah. be super and here but the thing is here is where the church of uganda has gone against if you will its natural instincts and its natural preservation by agreeing to an outside moratorium on something it doesn't agree with in order for the greater good to succeed so when i see these articles lambasting the archbishop Kazimba for what his statements I'm thinking you fool you just don't understand that this man is giving up something in order to uphold the principles that Gafcon has been founded on and he could be like the Kenyans or the Sudanese and just okay well give me a pass on this one and then no more women bishops to the next woman bishop no more women bishops to the next woman bishop Ugandans are playing it straight, and they need to be praised for that, not condemned. Okay, GAFCON's in the news. We have a date for GAFCON 4. It's going to be in Kigali, Rwanda, April 16th through the 23rd of 2023. Is that right? Yes, yeah. five years after the last Jerusalem one, right. where you and I... Uh, Lost about ten pounds each walking up the hills. <laughs> Gosh, Everything lots of hills. It was uphill. Or, or, is uphill. And, and hard stone sidewalks. You know, it's the hardest stuff you can walk on. But had a lot of fun. I've been to every Gafcon. I intend to be to the next Gafcon. So, yeah, you know, looking forward to it. Any issues they need to no. discuss at the next well, Gafcon? Yes, <laughs> um, plenty of issues. Yeah we don't have an agenda we don't have a theme we just have sort of general platitudes uh in other words uh daniel willis the uh administrator of gafcon you know told uh russell powell of the sydney anglicans that you know we're all our endeavors flow out of the bible's called to the gospel of jesus christ to the nations that's a good statement yeah. but that's not unique to GAFCON. So 
GAFCON is going to have to raise the money for 3,000 plus delegates and press and hangers on. Mm-hmm. Uh, to att- people will have to pay to attend, but many people will have to be subsidized. They don't want this to be suburban soccer moms from the United States on safari uh, in a church setting. They want to have equal and uh, uh, representative voices from around the communions, GAFCON's members. Mm-hmm. But they need money to do that. That's right. Because people from South Sudan just can't get up and go to Kigali for a Sunday to a Sunday. This will be on the first, from the beginning on the first Sunday after Easter to the second Sunday after Easter, 2023. So GAFCON is going to have to raise a lot of money in the next year. It's going to have to have a theme that will attract wealthy Americans who will want to basically overpay to subsidize other people while at the same time have something that is worth going to. A cheerleading session is not really worth well, the four uh, five thousand it's gonna cost an American to go. GAFCON won you know, a success. Uh, it launched the ACNA um, success. GAFCON two was hey we're gonna retake the shores of uh, Britain uh, and we're gonna, GAFCON will invade Britain and that didn't go so well. GAFCON 3, what was the message there? We're in trouble. We're in trouble. With England. <laughs> We're in trouble. With England. Seriously, <laughs> well, the yeah, message, <laughs> it was, had a lot of good speakers. It was a sure. great time to get together, but mm. the the fighting within the British contingent, the English contingent, was a mess. basically overshadowed everything else. Yeah. Uh, from M- N- Michael Nazar Ali to Gavin Ashenden to... Mm. Uh, the uh, Susie Leaf, the St. The, Helens, yeah. you know, all that they mm. they couldn't agree yeah. on a common strategy, a common leadership, a common, and the British and the English bishops who were there were basically timid because I think the thumb was being pressed on them by Justin Welby. Um, so we'll see what is Gafgon for going to go into sort of a post mortem. Why have we not been able to capitalize on the successes at the beginning? Or are we, and here the here is our plan to go forward. Um, now, I think they also have to wait to see what happens with living love and faith, That's the Church right. of yeah. England document. So in 2023, if the Church of England by that time is fully bought into the gay marriage agenda, there they've got an animating issue that will attract uh, Westerners to come and we'll see a revival of the uh, assault once again on the Church of England's territory. But, you know, these things are unknowns at this stage. They are. Well, they're unknown uh, just because I have, we have a large British audience. A lot of people from the UK can't wait to click on anything unscripted and and learn what's happening here in america we talk about what's happening in europe we talk about anglicanism all over the world but in sadly or strangely britain is just a little screwed up the church of england makes our news a lot and it shouldn't uh right now they're uh they're canceling a black man the, the, I, that would be news here in america uh, that would be new, you know, but to, to read about that in England, you're just like, what's going on, George? What's well, the story? Calvin Robinson, Calvin Robinson is a young man, mm-hmm. and I would call him the British Candace Owens. Sure. What do I mean by that? He is on GB uh, Network. He's a talking head, a commentator, uh, an opinion person like Candace Owens is. Young, articulate, conservative, black. Well, conservative? How did he even get on TV? Well, that's why he's on GB now, uh, which okay. is sort of the Fox. Uh, yes. The whole sort of the place that Fox does in, in the United States or Newsmax or one that O&E. Well, he articulate, well-educated, very, very, uh, you know, this man also feels a call of the ordained ministry of the Church of England. And he has a sponsor of ordination. He went to seminary while he's doing his TV show. And he's basically saying, I'm going to be via vocational. I'll work as a curate while I continue to do my television work. 
And somebody in the Diocese of London basically told the Bishop of Fulham, Jonathan Baker, uh, who is the, bish the flying bishop for London, that you have to basically tell Calvin Robinson that he's embarrassing us because we will go out of our way and die in the ditch. There's this one young black, black priest named Gerald, uh, his, that's his first name, who uh, made a national ass out of himself by his comments following the death of a beloved British leader figure. And the whole Bishop Sarah Mullally was, well, he has a right to say this. We're a diverse church uh, that let a hundred schools of cont uh, thought contend, let a thousand flowers bloom, to quote Mao Zedong or it's Sarah right. Wally. <laughs> well, if those thousand flowers are all liberal, woke flowers, the Church of England welcomes them, especially yeah. when it comes from minorities. But when a minority says wokeness is destroying British culture, when a minority says we need to stick to the Bible, and not to the, the conventional wisdom of the left, this man is immediately canceled. This guy, I don't even know how far he, how he got this far. Well, Jonathan Baker, the weak need, weak chinned Bishop of Fulham, uh, why do I say that? Why am I being cruel to him? Well, Jonathan Baker is the bishop for conservatives, those against the ordination of women, those who cannot in good conscience allow remarry divorcees in church, well, he's divorced and has married the wife of one of his priests, and the and he's a former and he's a Freemason. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, one, uh, that highlights Church of England. So if yeah. you if you want somebody to basically be the guy in charge of the uh, conscience conservatives, let's pick somebody who's got two strikes against him that are pretty major. So Baker basically says, you've got to choose to Robinson, give up your career or give up the priesthood. And Robinson is able, because he has a pub pulpit through the TV, to basically point out the hypocrisy of the Church of England, the hypocrisy of its leaders, of their calls for diversity, their calls for inclusion, their calls that we want everybody to represent this church. When it's put into practice, it's a lie. They don't do that. They don't but, appoint conservative bishops. They don't allow conservatives to be ordained to the or, to the ministry. Yeah, there, there's no mutual flourishing at all in the church of England. But I want to get back to the power of a person of color who's conservative. They have to be canceled because a person of color who's conservative has a thousand times, ten thousand, a hundred times the voices of a white conservative mm. because they're they're pointing out the lie of liberalism they're pointing out the lie uh, of wokeness and critical race theory they're saying no that's not true and when you have a person of color telling you something's not true you, you're going to listen wait wait we've been told something else for the last decade or generation well, why do you say it's not true and people will tune into that Mm -hmm. And we we find that here in America with you know Walter E. Williams and other uh, great black uh, conservatives, Larry Elder in California, Larry Elder, you know th th these people who speak the truth and uh, have the mathematical economic backgrounds. Uh, they're professors of coll in colleges uh, to to back up what they say. And See, Calvin Calvin Robinson is not. A, a, be a beneficiary of the affirmative action regime that we yeah. have in the West, in the United States, and in England, of being a black liberal, he gets a job that he's not qualified for. He gets advanced so that the what the white liberals can pat themselves on the back and saying, "Look what we've done! We've achieved racial harmony and polarity by basically giving this unqualified person a job." Um, this was the argument uh, with the recent Supreme Court issue. This is the argument sw uh, swirling around the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, Claudine Gay, yeah. uh, an incompetent whose uh, researches have been proven to be fraudulent. She's still Dean of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. She and makes she up her uh, research. And, and, you know, and it's like Elizabeth Warren becoming the, f Elizabeth Warren went to Rutgers Law School which is a good, solid, mm -hmm. mid-level 
law school for people. It's not Harvard. It's not Yale. It's not Yale and so on and so forth. Yeah. But she was able to get a job teaching as a law professor when she lied and said she was a Native American. And that's just Calvin Robinson is somebody who's saying, I'm not a victim. I don't need to be advanced to fill your racism quotas. You know, let merit be the determining factor in arguments, not who is saying it or the color of their skin. And this is dangerous to the hierarchy of the Church of England because this goes against, you know, everything Justin Welby has been working for and standing for. Uh, There's a Justin Welby gave uh, two Easter sermons. Uh, one of them was more godly than the other, and the other, he, you know, it was a 15-minute sermon, and he had a few comments attacking the government. It wasn't a 15-minute tirade against the government, but of course, the press have to report something, and Welby, uh, Welby attacked the the uh, government's uh, policies on uh, illegal immigration. We don't need to get into the details of it because that's unimportant. But Welby, Welby had the uh, courage, some people would say, the balls, other people would say, or the effrontery to say that God is on my side, and if you disagree with me, you are going against the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, here's a man uh, who has no credibility, if you will, on ethical and moral issues? He would be a hypocrite in this area, yes. Not on immigration, but as a person who wants to speak fully uh, as a humble person. And I I don't want to, you know, clearly in America we're protected from uh, the the slander and libel laws of of, of the UK, but um, he's not practicing what he preaches. And that's been that's been reported elsewhere. That's been documented. Uh, we have talked to people who have witnessed it and who have been a victim of it. And uh, <sighs> there's dead bishops who would give testimony to uh, Justin Welby's uh, hypocrisy. Yeah. And what makes it so hard is that when Welby was uh, appointed Archbishop, he was the great hope for the evangelicals. He was, he was a Holy Trinity uh, Brompton person. He was somebody who spoke their language, and and yet he's proven to be the worst sort of institutionalists in advancing liberal causes. Now the liberals will never trust him. They'll never give him a break. Uh, he's not one of them. They know that. He is a turncoat, uh, and, and to evangelicals, he's a disappointment and a turncoat. And so all he has now is the institution, and the the institution follows the conventional wisdom. The only people backing Justin Welby in this whole debate are the Archbishop of York, the Archbishop, the Bishop of Chelmsford, other clergy people, while people in the political world are basically. You know, Tim Montgomery, uh, who's a commentator, who's also a Christian, said, you know, how dare the Archbishop of Canterbury tell me that his view is the view held by Jesus? Uh, This was, well, from a PR perspective, well, how should I put this? Either Justin Welby is playing a very deep game, or I mean, He's making all sorts of liberal noises and platitudes and promises while we have the LLF process unfold. So people think he's going to go in one direction. When what is really going to happen is they're going to adopt the conservative no gay marriage. So Welby has to sort of smooth the, uh, the passage and then go, go right. That could be a deep plan. Or he could be so divorced from the reality of the life of the church, and he could be such a creature of the institution, he just doesn't understand what's going on or has any connection to the people in the pews or the vast majority of clergy. Um, I'll give you an example of something I think may indicate not a deep plan, but just isolation from the real world. Uh, the church of England's safeguarding has been a major issue major issue 
the abuse problems and all this and that and and time after time we have these lessons will be learned statements well national the the director of safeguarding some, one of our viewers pointed out to me the position has been vacant for almost a year and a half almost 18 months what does that tell you are they looking for somebody really hard are the people who are good at this saying i'm not getting involved with the church of england because they don't want to change um what does it tell you when you've got an 18 months vacancy with just temporary and acting directors for the one of the major issues facing the church that it thought that they're not serious about it or that the professionals in this industry look at the church of england as irrede irredeemable or there's just too many pedophiles within the church to de to deal with. I mean, they're, they're just I don't think there are any more than there are in the in your public school. I mean, no, I yeah. But here's the point that I think you know I, I wanted to center in on here. He gave this sermon on Easter. Nobody cares. Once again, the Church of England. Uh, some of the Anglican Communion, certainly Lambeth, is unarticulated to the column of we don't care what you say anymore. You've lost the benefit of the doubt. You've lost the voice in England. You've lost any representation of the, what a church should be. And if you can't represent the church, you certainly can't represent a secular voice as well. So keep your politics to yourself. That's what we get. Nobody cares what Justin Welby says. Uh, holy cow. It's a shame, really. Yeah, That's it is. Shame. No, absolutely. Uh, the leaders of the churches, Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, should have, and I, there's more out there, of course, should have a voice in our culture. And they used to. They used to be a place the press would go to and say, what does the church think? What do you, as a leader of the church, think? They don't do that anymore. You know, right now, uh, um, all I saw on the Daily Mail was Harry and Meghan all uh, throughout the, the Invictus games or whatever it's called. Uh, it was like five or six stories. It had nothing to do with Justin Well, but you didn't make any of my news feeds. Uh, George, you have to have a special Google search set up so he comes up on yours. Nobody cares. You've made the church irrelevant. Congratulations. Your predecessor helped a little bit. You know, wasn't, I'm not going to give you all the credit. But, you know, in, in this day and age, people should be talking about, you know, Justin really loves Jesus. And we can tell because he talks about Jesus and he's moving the church towards Jesus. He's not adding anything to Jesus. He's not subtracting anything from Jesus. Not doing that. I, and I don't want to be critical, but I don't know. Don't know. I heard a great Easter service uh, this Sunday. You gave a great Easter service this Sunday. It happened all over the world. It could have happened at Lambeth as well. Oh, well. George, is that our last story? I think that's that's going to do it. We, we even talked about Indian corruption today already. Oh, we're going to let the audience off easy. We've only got 38 minutes. That's our Easter gift to you. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 728 of Anglican Unscripted. I think it's time for our Easter tide naps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> time, time to go. Oh. <laughs>